Hey guys, thank you for joining me. So I wanted to talk to you guys about a case that took place in North Carolina. It is so similar to the Watts case that it is ridiculously funny, I guess. Iron, irony, coincidental, whatever I guess you want to say there. So a little bit of backstory. Jeffrey McDonald was a physician who he ended up joining the military, became a physician for the military. He actually specialized in neck surgeries in that area. It's, it was called something specifically, but I cannot think of the name. <laughs> so he was assigned to the third special forces group, um, a group of surgeons at um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, his wife and his kids um, joined him there and they lived on the base on, at 544 Castle Drive. Um, him and his wife, Colette, were known to have argued a bit. Uh, Colette had gotten a bachelor's degree or she hadn't actually gotten it, um, but she was trying to become an English teacher. She was doing a bachelor's degree in English literature. Um, they had two daughters and they both had developed very distinguished personalities. Kimberly being marketably or marketedly feminine, intelligent and shy and Christian, very tomboy and run over and crack someone, you know, if their older sister was being bullied, stuff like that. Shortly before Christmas, 1969, um, with his wife approximately three months pregnant and their third child with their third child and first son, McDonald bought his daughters a Shetland pony, anticipating that the family would re relocate to a farm in Connecticut. Um, he kept this uh, purchase a secret from his wife and his children. He and his stepfather drove them to the stable as a surprise on Christmas Day. His daughter chose to name the pony Trooper. The same month, Colette is known to have penned a letter to the college acquaintance in which she described her life as never being so normal or happy, adding that she and her husband were content and that their baby son was due to be born in July and her family would be complete. By 1970, McDonald had earned the rank of captain he was planning to study advanced medical training at Yale University upon completion of his tour of duty as a Green Beret doctor. Okay, so on the afternoon of February 16th, McDonald took his daughters to feed and ride the pony that he had bought them for Christmas. The trio then returned home at about 5.45 p.m. McDonald then showered and changed into an old pair of blue pajamas. After the family ate supper, Colette left the household to attend an evening teaching class at Fort Bragg's North Carolina University Extension. According to McDonald, he then played horsey, allowing his daughters to ride upon his back as if he was the Shetland pony. For a short, for a short while before he had to put Christian to bed at approximately 7 p.m. as Kimberly played a game on the coffee table. He then slept for an hour before watching Kimberly's favorite television show, Laugh In, with her before his older daughter also went to bed. Um, Colette returned home at 9.40 p.m. The two sat on the couch watching television together before Colette decided to go to bed midway through The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. McDonald had himself fallen asleep in the living room in the early hours of the following day. At 3.42 a.m. on February the 17th, 1970, dispatchers at Fort Bragg received an emergency phone call from McDonald, who faintly spoke into the receiver, help, 544, Castle Drive, stabbing, 544, Castle Drive, stabbing, hurry. The operator then heard the sound of the receiver clatter against the wall or floor. Within 10 minutes, of responding, military police had arrived at the address, initially believing that they were responding to a domestic disturbance. They found the front door closed and locked and the house inside dark. Um, when no one answered the door, they circled around the back of the house where a sergeant discovered that the back screen door closed and unlocked and the back door wide open. 
Upon entering, the sergeant walked into the master bedroom before running to the front of the house, shouting, tell them to get Womack ASAP. Colette McDonald was discovered sprawled on the floor of the master bedroom. She lay on her back with one eye open and one breast exposed. She had been repeatedly clubbed about her body with both her forearms later being found to be broken. The pathologist would note these wounds had likely been inflicted as Colette had raised her arms to protect her face. In addition, she was stabbed 21 times in the chest with an ice pick and 16 about the neck and the chest with a knife with her trachea severed in two places. A bloody and torn pajama top was draped upon her chest and a paring knife lay in beside her body. Beside her, Jeffrey McDonald was lying face down, alive but wounded, with his face on Colette's chest and one arm around her neck. As military personnel approached, he whispered, check my kids. I heard my kids crying. Five-year-old Kimberly was found in her bed, having been repeatedly bludgeoned about the head and body and stabbed in the neck with a knife between eight and nine eight and ten times. She laid on her left side. Her skull had been fractured from at least two blows to the right side of her head and one, one, one wound to her face that caused her cheekbone to protrude through her skin. Oh my God. The wounds to Kimberly's head were so severe in nature to have caused, that they caused bruising to her brain. She was in a coma and death soon after infliction. Across the hallway, two-year-old Kristen was found in her own bed, also laying on her left side with a baby puddle close to her mouth. She had been stabbed 33 times across the chest, neck, hands, and back with a knife, and 15 times with an ice pick. Two knife wounds had penetrated her heart, and the ice pick were noted to be shallow. The injuries to her hands were likely defensive wounds. On the headboard of the McDonald's marital bed, the word pig was written in eight inch capital letters. The blood used to write this word was determined to be Colette's. Having received impromptu re resuscitation, McDonald's sat upright then, ex then exclaimed, Jesus Christ, look at my wife. I'm gonna kill those goddamn acid heads. He was immediately taken to Womack Hospital shouting, let me see my kids. And then he carried out of his home on a stretcher as he was carried out of his home on a stretcher. Oh my God. Oh, that's a lot. So McDonald's account of the night was, um, oh my goodness. <sighs> Sorry, y'all. That was deep. That's a lot. Um, he was in the hospital for nine days. He didn't have any life-threatening wounds um, or anything that required stitching. He was questioned by the Criminal Investigation Division, CID. McDonald claimed that at two, about 2 a.m. on February the 17th, he had washed the evening's dinner dishes before deciding to go to bed. Although, because his younger daughter, Christian, had wet his side of the bed, he had taken her to her own bed not wishing to wake his wife to change the sheets. He had then taken a blanket from Kristen's room and fell asleep, fallen asleep on the living room couch. According to McDonald, he was later awakened by Colette and Kimberly's screams and call out shouting, Jeff, Jeff, help. Why are they doing this to me? As he rose from the couch to go to their aid, he was attacked by three male intruders, one black and one two white. The shorter of the two white men had worn lightweight, possibly surgical gloves. A fourth intruder he described as a white female with long blonde hair, possibly a wig, and wearing high-heeled, knee-high boots with a white floppy hat partially covering her face. The individual stood nearby holding a lit, a light, a lit candle, chanting, Acid is groovy, kill the pigs. McDonald claims that the three males then attacked him with a club and an ice pick, with the female intruder shouting, hit him again, 
During the struggle, his pajama top was pulled over his head to his wrist and he <clears throat> was used and had used this to bound the garment to ward off thrust from the ice pick. Although eventually he was overcome by his assailants and knocked unconscious in the living room. <sighs> uh, the living room ended the hallway leading to the bedrooms. When he had regained consciousness, the intruders had left the house. He then stumbled from room to room, attempting mouth to mouth resuscitation upon each of his daughters to no avail before discovering his wife. He had pulled a small paring knife from Ch Colette, Colette's chest, which he then tossed onto the floor, attempting in vain to find her pulse, then draped his pajama jacket over her body, and then he phoned for help. So within minutes of the discovery at Castle Drive, military police were instructed to check the occupants of all vehicles in and around Fort Bragg, seeking two white men, one black and one white woman with blonde hair and a floppy hat in an effort to apprehend the four intruders McDonald alleged had attacked him and his family. Despite these efforts, military police failed to locate the four intruders and the, to an, and the, yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. The initiative was abandoned by 6 a.m. Shortly after daylight on February the 17th, investigators recovered the murder weapon just outside the back door. These instruments were an old hockey, oh, an old hickory, I'm sorry, an old hickory kitchen knife, an ice pick, and a 31 long piece of lumbar with two blue threads attached with blood. All three were quickly determined to have come from the McDonald household. And all had been wiped clean with, of fingerprints. McDonald later claimed that to have never seen these items before. Um, as Army investigators studied the physical evidence, the Army CID quickly came to disbelieve McDonald's version of the events, as they found very little evidence to support his version of it. Although McDonald was trained in unarmed combat, the living room where he was supposedly fought for his life against three armed assailants showed few signs of a struggle apart from a kitchen coffee table that had been knocked onto its side with a pile of magazines beneath the edge and a flower plant, plant which had fallen to the floor. Questioning of the McDonald's neighbors revealed that they heard no sa sounds of a struggle or disturbance in the household um, in the early hours, but had heard Colette shouting in a long and angry voice. The 16-year-old daughter of these neighbors who occasionally babysat for the family informed investigators the two had um, seemed indifferent to each other in the months prior to the murders. By February the 23rd, um, FBI discontinued their search for the four, four intruders. In addition to the lack of damage to the inside of the house, no fibers from McDonald's torn pajama top were found in the living room where he claimed the garment had been torn in his struggle with the intruders. However, fibers from the pajama top were found beneath Colette's body and in the bedrooms of both of his daughters. And one fiber from his garment was also found under Kristen's fingernail. A single fragment of skin was discovered from beneath one of Colette's fingernails, although this evidence was later lost. Um, Bloodstained splinters, likely sourcing from the section of lumber recovered close to the back door at the apartments, were recovered from all three bedrooms of the apartment, but not the room where McDonald claimed to have been attacked. No blood or fingerprints were found on either telephone McDonald claimed he had used to call for help after checking each member of his family and attempting to resuscitate them. Furthermore, the blood-stained tip of a surgical glove also found beneath the headboard where the blood inscription was written. This glove was identical in um, composite form to the military supply McDonald invariably kept in the family kitchen. Although it had rained on the night of 16th to the 17th of February, and McDonald also specifically claimed the female intruder's boots were all wet with rainwater just dripping off of them. The sole footprint observed at the scene was a bloody Blair, 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 Blair footprint 
located in Kristen's bedroom, leading to the child's bed in the direction of the doorway. By mid-March, the CID had obtained results of forensic testing of the blood, hair, and fiber samples um, within 544 Castle Drive, which contradicted McDonald's accounts of his movements and further convinced investigators of his guilt. An example, Kimberly's blood was also found on his pajama top, even though McDonald had claimed he was not wearing this garment while in her room attempting resuscitation. McDonald's own blood was located in um, significant quantities in only two locations, in front of the kitchen cabinet containing rubber gloves and upon the right side of the hallway bathroom sink. Investigators also questioned why Colette's blood was found in Christian's room. Although all three victims were found in separate rooms, suggesting that they had been attacked separately, um, Kimberly had been attacked as she entered the master bedroom. Evidence showed that Kimberly had been attacked when she entered the master bedroom. Investigators questioned why home intruders were bothered to carry her back to her bedroom to continue their attack. All four members of the McDonald's family had different blood types. The movement of each member of the household and their subsequent theory as to a likely scenario of the involved events with using the DNA. Upon the assumption that four individuals discovered by the responding military police were the only four people in the house in the early hours of February the 17th, investigators were able to reconstruct a likely scenario of the chain events, which unfolded via blood typing and the nature and severity of the wounds discovered upon each individual. So this is the reconstruction of what they think happened, right? An argument or fight between McDonald and Colette began in the master bedroom, possibly over the issue of Christian's repeated wetting his side of the bed while sleeping there, or his adultery. Investigators speculated that the argument turned physical and she had probably hit him on the forehead with a hairbrush, which resulted in his concussion. As he retaliated by hitting her, first with his fist, then beating her with a piece of lumber, Kimberly, whose blood and brain serum, oh my God, was found in the doorway, may have walked in after hearing the commotion and was struck or at least w once on the head, possibly by accident. Believing Colette dead, McDonald carried the mortally wounded Kimberly back to her bedroom. After stabbing her, McDonald then proceeded to Christian's room, carrying the club he had used to bludgeon Kimberly, intending on, dis um, intending on disposing of the last remaining potential witness. Before he could do so, Colette, whose blood was found on Christian's bed covers and on one wall of her room, apparently regained consciousness stumbled into her younger daughter's bedroom, threw her own body over Christians in a desperate effort to protect her. After killing both, McDonald then wrapped Colette's body in a sheet and carried her body to the master bedroom, leaving a smudge footprint matching her blood type as he exited Christian's bedroom. CID investigators then theorized that McDonald attempted to cover up the murders using articles on the Manson family murders that he had recently read in the March 1970 issue of Esquire. Investigators had found in the living room. Putting on surgical gloves from a medical supply in the kitchen closet, he went to the master bedroom where he used Colette's blood to write the word pig on the headboard. McDonald then laid his torn pajama top over her dead body and repeatedly stabbed her in the chest with an ice pick. Then he discarded the weapons close to the back door of the property after wiping them clean of fingerprints. Finally, McDonald had taken a scalpel blade from the supply closet, entered the adjacent bathroom, stabbed himself once in the chest while standing aside the sink, before disposing of the surgical gloves. He then used the family's telephone to summon an ambulance before lying beside Colette's body as he waited for the military police to arrive. Um, on April the 6th, 1970, Army investigators formally cautioned then interrogated McDonald. He was first offered the chance to recount the version of events and he 
recounted his claims of being attacked by foreign intruders, whom he grappled before falling to the ground, observing the top of some boots, and being rendered unconscious before regaining consciousness, experiencing, experiencing you know, uh, basically, um, pneumothorax, I can't even pronounce it, <laughs> I guess amnesia-ish. Investigators were unconvinced of McDonald's accounts. Midway through questioning, McDonald was asked a question about his stab wounds by CID investigator William A. Ivory. You didn't do it yourself, did you? This question prompted, <laughs> prompted McDonald to deny accusations before re referencing his puncture wound and having to persuade hospital doctors to insert a chest tube to, into his body as he was sure that his lung was punctured. Questioning then focused upon the crime scene and results of forensic testing. McDonald denied any of the murder weapons had originated from his household. Despite the fact the section of lumber matched wood from Kimberly's closet, he also claimed to be unaware of how the fiber and blood evidence contradicted his accounts of his movements and actions. At one point, claiming the intruders could account for the fact a pocket torn from his pajama top and spattered with Colette's blood had been found in a section of the bedroom far from his wife's body, despite the fact he claimed to have had this garment around his arms in his living room struggle with the intruders and to only have the garment draped over his body after they had left, you know. Um, investigator Robert Shaw then questioned McDonald as the lack of disorder and damage within the household and a lack of any motive, stating that in the investigator's experience had four intruders embarked on a murder murderous frenzy within a small household, they would expect to encounter evidence such as busted furniture, broken mirrors, bashed in walls, and the only signs of struggle were the top heavy living room coffee table, which had not flipped over all the way in the midst of his struggles, and a flower pot beside the table with a plant upon the carpet and the pot standing upright. McDonald was unable to offer a plausible explanation for this observation and also claimed to be unaware of how Kimberly's blood and brain serum were recovered from the master bedroom. Um, following a short break, questioning resumed the same afternoon. Investigator Franz Gibner listed further physical discrepancies between McDonald's account and the forensic evidence, repeatedly stating all the facts pointed to his having staged the crime scene. McDonald was unable to offer a plausible explanation to this questioning before abruptly accusing Gibner of having run out of ideas and attempting to frame him to maintain a 100% solved homicide rate. In response, Gibner stated, we have all this business here that would tend to indicate that you were involved in this rather than people who came from outside and picked 544 Castle Drive and went up there and were lucky enough to find your door open. When investigators asked McDonald to submit to a polygraph test to verify his account, he readily agreed. Although within 10 minutes of the conclusion of the interview, he called investigators to state he had changed his mind and would not submit to any polygraph testing. Sorry, I needed a drink. So on the evening of April 6th, McDonald was relieved of his duties and placed under restricted restrictions pending further inquiries. The following day, he was appointed an army attorney at the recommendation of his mother. On April 10th, he hired a flamboyant uh, civilian defense attorney named Bernard C C Siegel sorry, to defend him. Less than a month later, on May the 1st, the Army formally charged McDonald with three counts of murder. The same day, McDonald penned a letter to Colette's mother and stepfather-in-law um, professing his innocence, emphasizing that the Army would never admit to their era and speculating his wife's soul may hold inf infinite patience and understanding of his current legal predicament. So, um, an initial Army Article 32 hearing 
into McDonald's possible guilt overseen by Colonel um, Warren Rock conveyed on July the 6th, 1970. This hearing lasted until September. McDonald's lawyer, Bernard, adopted an offensive strategy on behalf of his client at this hearing, citing numerous examples of incompetence on the behalf of the Army CID, who he stated had clumsily and unprofessionally trampled all over the crime scene during their examination of the house, obliter obliterating any traces of evidence of the perpetrators and what they may have left, and losing vital pieces of evidence during a single thread, including a single thread found beneath Kimberly's nail, McDonald's pajama trousers, um, four torn tips of rubber surgical gloves found in the master bedroom, and a single layer of skin found beneath one of Colette's fingernails. Um, Bernard elicited several examples of incompetence from the military police and responded personnel, responding personnel, including testimony revealing an ambulance driver had stolen McDonald's wallet from the living room and a pathologist who testified to having failed to obtain the children's fingerprints for a comparison at the crime scene. The first witness to testify in McDonald's defense, responding mi military policeman, Kenneth Mika, um, testified that on the way to answering McDonald's emergency call on the night of the murders, he observed a blonde woman with a wide-brimmed hat standing on a street corner approximately half a mile from the McDonald home. He noted his sighting was unusual given the hour, late hour, and the weather. Mika also testified that contrary to instruction, an ambulance driver had placed the tilted flower pot upright while at the crime scene. Um, Colonel Rock also testified that he himself went to the crime scene and that the crime um, and, had and tipped the coffee table over with it uh, striking the side of a rocking chair and coming to the rest of the edge. Rock also noted that the fact that if no wet footprints and mud were found at the crime scene belonging to the alleged intruders, that meant the crime scene investigators had also failed to find any evidence of the large numbers of military police and civilians who walked around the house. Um, in August, Siegel was approached by a delivery man named William Posey, who claimed the blonde woman McDonald stated had attacked his family, maybe a local 17-year-old drug addict and police informant named Helena um, Stockley. According to Posey, Stockley had been in company of two or three young males in a car parked outside her apartment at approximately 4 a.m. on the morning of the murders. Posey also claimed that Stockley had see, was seized wearing her boots and floppy hat um, on February the 17th and had dressed in black on the date of the funerals, also stating to him that she did not remember what she did on the dates of the murder. Posey later relayed this message, this information at a hearing, adding that Stockley had informed him months later she and her boyfriend could not marry until we go out and kill some more people. Stockley was located and questioned. Although her answers were vague and self-contradictory regarding her whereabouts on February the 17th, she recalled being in the company of her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, on the night of February the 16th and going out for a ride in the car in the early hours of the following day, driving aimlessly, but claimed to have been so far out, um, she could not say whether, I think, I guess, mescaline? I don't even know what that is. What is that? She could not say whether she had been at the house or not. Although witnesses had claimed Stockley had admitted her involvement in the murders, with several also remembering her wearing clothing similar to that described by McDonald on the date in question, she was not subpoenaed to testify. Procedural inaccuracies regarding investigative conduct in the Stockley was also highlighted by Siegel at the hearing. So McDonald's testimony now. Following favorable character testimony from several acquaintances and a military psychiatrist, 
McDonald testified for three days in mid-August. Um, sections of his testimony contradicted what he had informed investigators on April the 6th, including his claim on this occasion to have actually moved Colette's body, having found her a little bit propped up against the chair before he just sort of laid her flat on the floor. He also said that possibly because of his surgical background, he had sort of rinsed off his hands as he checked his own injuries in the bathroom before calling for help, referencing the type B blood found in the kitchen. McDonald testified that he may have also washed his hands in the kitchen sink for some reason prior to making the phone call to emergency services. Contrary to medical reports and his earlier accounts, he also claimed to have located two bumps on the back of the head and two or three puncture wounds in his upper left chest. Other wounds to his right bicep and approximately 10 ice pick wounds to his abdomen. Um, on February the 17th and 18th, all which had healed without treatment and none of which required surgery. Questioned in regards to his infidelity, McDonald admitted that he had been unfaithful on two occasions, but insisted Colette had not known about either affair. He also claimed that their time at Fort Bragg had been the most content of their married life. McDonald's testimony was followed by that of a clinical psychologist who testified as to the concussions in a series of tests he had conducted on McDonald. The individual um, testified the test revealed an extraordinary absence of anxiety, depression, and anger in McDonald with regards to the loss of his family, and that his report concluded that he was unable to muster massive denial or repression to such a degree that the impact of recent events in his life had been blunted. Furthermore, the extreme psychological response would likely see the individual convey himself as victimized or perhaps somewhat of a martyr. Sorry about that, guys. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, on October 13th, 1970, Colonel Rock issued a report recommending that charges be dismissed against, dismissed against McDonald as insufficient ev evidence existed to prove his guilt. Um, adding his belief, no truth existed in the charges and that the nature of the murders led him to believe that the perpetrators were either insane or under the influence of drugs. Rock also recommended that civilian authorities further investigate Stockley. Later the same month, all charges were formally dismissed, although a new CID investigation tasked with finding the murders was assembled um, in, in February 1971 with McDonald still considered a suspect. In December, McDonald recommended an honorable dis received an honorable discharge from the Army and initially returned to New York City, where he briefly worked as a doctor before relocating to Long Beach, California in July 1971 in an, in an effort to put the past behind him and to distance himself from the constant reminders of his wife and daughters. He attained employment as an emergency room physician at the St. Mary Medical Center, frequently working long hours. He also became an instructor at the UCLA Medical School, a medical director of the Long Beach Grand Prix, a lecturer on the subject of the recognition and treatment of child abuse and a participant in the development of a national cardiopulmonary resuscitation training program. McDonald lived in a $3,500,000 Huntington Beach condominium apartment and is known to have lived a promiscuous lifestyle prior to forming a long-term relationship 
with a 22-year-old airline stewardess named Candy Kramer in the late 1970s. In the years immediately following the dismissal of the murder charges, McDonald received an abundance of emotional and public support. He also wrote letters to several magazines and newspapers detailing his willingness to further publicize the background and legalities of his case. Within days of the dismissal, McDonald began granting press interviews and media appearances. Most notably on December the 15th, 1970, the Dick Cavett Show, during which he appeared um, as and complained about the Army investigation and their focus on him as a suspect. On this occasion, he claimed to have sustained 23 wounds, some of which he claimed were potentially fatal. McDonald's stepfather-in-law, Alfred Kassab, um, had initially believed in his stepson's stepson-in-law's innocence, but both he and Colette's mother, Mildred, had testified in support of McDonald during the Army's Article 32 hearing. Informing the press, my wife and I feel very strongly about Captain McDonald's innocence. After all, it was our daughter and two grandchildren who were butchered. However, by November 1970, Kassab had grown suspicious of McDonald's repeated reluctance to provide him with a copy of the 2,000 page tra transcript of the Article 32 hearing. In, a, in an apparent effort to discourage Kassab's effort to obtain a copy of this tran transcript in his pursuit of the killers, McDonald told his stepfather-in-law that he and some army colleagues were actually had actually tracked down, tortured, and eventually murdered one of the alleged four alleged murders. Kassab's suspicion greatly increased following McDonald's casual and dismissive, uh, dis dismissive demeanor on the Dick Cavett show. Just days after he had himself hand delivered 500 copies of an 11 page letter to members of the Congress requesting a congressionally mandated reinvestigation of the murders, he and his wife publicly turned against McDonald. Kassab successfully obtained a copy of the Article 32 transcript from the Army in 1971. He repeatedly studied the document, realizing McDonald's claims were inconsistent with the physical facts and concluding his account was nothing more than a tissue of lies, which repeatedly contradicted the known facts of the case. One example was McDonald's assertion that he had sustained life-threatening injuries including 10 ice pick wounds during the alleged physical assault at the hands of his assailants. Kassab had met McDonald in the hospital less than 18 hours after the attack and had observed him sitting up in bed eating a meal with a very long bandaging or other, um, with very little bandaging or other medical dressings on his body. An examination of hospital records confirmed McDonald had received no such wounds. Kassab also discovered that within weeks of the murders of his family, McDonald had been begun dating a young woman employed at Fort Bragg. He and his wife also discovered that by 1969, he had rekindled um, his relationship with Penny Wells. With the cooperation of Provost Marshal Krenowinik and other army investigators, Kassab visited the crime scene for several hours in order to compare the physical evidence again against McDonald's testimony. In March 1971, the personal assessment ultimately convinced Kassab of McDonald's guilt, and he resolved to devote his life in pursuing all legal avenues to bring McDonald to justice. As the Army's investigation was completed, the only way Kassab could bring McDonald to trial was via a citizen's complaint filed through the United States Department of Justice. He filed his complaint in early 1972. Although because the murders had occurred while McDonald's was serving in the Army, he had since been discharged. The citizen's complaint was declared moot and FBI refused to take on the case. 
Between 1972 and 1974, the case trip trapped in limbo. Sorry, my dog is getting some water. My apologies. Okay. So the Department of Justice legal issues were raised with them and they debated over whether sufficient evidence and probable cause existed for indictment and prosecution. On April the 30th, 1974, the Kassabs, um, their attorney, Richard Kane, who had agreed to pursue the cause litigation against McDonald and CID agent Peter Kearns, presented a civilian's complaint against McDonald in the U.S. Chief District Court. Judge Al Algernon Butler, like, there's some weird names, y'all, requesting the covening of a grand jury in a di in a, to indict McDonald for the murders. The following month, Justice Department uh, Attorney Victor Warhide ruled the case worthy of prosecution. On August the 12th, 1974, a grand jury conveyed before the U.S. District Judge Franklin Dupree in Riley, North Carolina, to hear the legal proceedings. Seventy-five witnesses were called to testify. McDonald was the first individual to testify at his hearing. His testimony lasted five days, during which he conceded that although he had publicly resolved to pursue all legal avenues, following the 1970 dismissal of the murder charges against him and the higher investigators, he had failed to do so. Although he was adamant that he had made his own efforts to identify the perpetrators and to locate Helena Stockley, he also claimed that the numerous fabrications he had provided to the Kassabs and to sections of the media in the interviewing years were to placate his in-laws and that he had received more stab and puncture wounds to his body than recorded in contemporary medical records, which he blamed on malpractice. When asked by Victor uh, if he had, if he would submit to either a polygraph or sodium amyltal test, I guess that's like um, a truth serum or something. Like, what's that? I gotta look into that after I do this video. Um, McDonald read a statement prepared by his attorneys denying their request. Other witness to testify included surgeons on duty at Womack Hospital who had examined McDonald and who testified that, aside from his punctured lung, McDonald was not in any great danger medically and that um, he had superficial stab wounds to his upper left arm and abdomen. McDonald had no other stab wounds to his body. A reporter who had covered the Article 32 hearing who interviewed McDonald after the charges were dropped also stated that in his experience, individuals under the influence of LSD seldom become violent and they, by contrast, those who consume um, amphetamines frequently do. On December the 12th, a former chief of psychiatry who had also testified at the 30, Article 32 hearing Dr. Bruce Bailey testified, Bailey stated that when discussing his family and the events surrounding their deaths with him, McDonald would occasionally become emotional, become tearful, but then he quickly recovered. Bailey also testified that he found McDonald to be con a controlling individual who was extremely dependent on what others thought of him and that he would often launch into a verbal tirade to allow his deep-seated emotions to become expressed by other means. When questioned as to whether McDonald suffered from a mental disorder, Bailey testified he did not, although he could not discount the possibility of him murdering members of his family in a situation of extreme stress. This testimony was followed by a Philadelphia-based psycho psychologist who conceded that had McDonald committed such an act of violence, he would successfully completely block this episode from his mind. The chief of the FBI crime laboratory chemistry section, Paul, then testified the pajama top placed over Collette's body had been heavily bloodstained before the garment was torn 
and that contrary to McDonald's claims, a lack of tearing at the edges of these holes proved that all 48 holes within this item of clothing had been inflicted while the garment was stationary rather than in motion. He also testified that all cuts within all the garments other than pajama top had been inflicted with the old hickory kitchen knife found outside the family home and not the parry knife he claimed to have removed from Colette's body. That the majority of this blood had belonged to Colette and her body transferred onto the garments. Her, I mean her body, her blood had transferred onto the garments and that at least four locations prior to the garment being torn. Furthermore, the club used to bludgeon Colette and Kimberly, which McDonald had denied any knowledge of, had also been sawed from one of the mattress slates in Kimberly's bedroom. And a single hair found in Colette's right palm had sourced from her own body and not a blonde haired intruder. McDonald also recalled to testify, was recalled to testify before the grand jury on January the 21st, 1975. On this occasion, he was marked, markedly arrogant and sarcastic when questioned with regards to issues such as his infidelity or the prosecution's illustration of forensic contradictions between his version of events and the physical evidence. And on one occasion shouting, I have no idea. I don't even know what crap you're trying to feed me. In response to a question as to how his blood and Colette's blood had transferred onto a sheet taken from Christian's bed bedroom into the master bedroom, he also refused to discuss the results of a private polygraph test to which he had consented to in 1970. The results that of which had been given to Bernard Siegel, Siegel, whatever his name is, indicating that he would have to speak with his attorney on this matter before consenting to this line of inquiry. Following the brief recess, McDonald read a statement prepared by his attorneys denying the prosecution's request to discuss the results of his 1970 polygraph examination, contending that he had violated attorney-client privileges, that his past attorney had, um, uh, had violated them. He then read his own statement to the jury claiming Five long years had passed since the murder of his family and his efforts to start life afresh and the questions posed by the prosecutions were ones that he had to live with for five years. Um, on January the 24th, 1975, the grand jury formally indicted McDonald on three counts of murder. Within the hour, he was arrested in California. On January the 31st, he was freed upon a $100,000 bail raised by friends and colleagues, pending disposition of the charges. Although he was arraigned on May the 23rd, he and pleaded not guilty to the murders on the state. On July the 29th, Judge Dupree um, denied the double jeopardy and speedy trial arguments successfully, um, sequentially, I'm sorry, filed, um, filed by his attorneys and allowing the proposed trial date of August the 18th, 1975 to stand. Although the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled to stay the proceedings on August the 15th, the panel of his court ordered the indictment dismissed on the grounds of the defendant's right to a speedy trial. On January the 23rd, 1976, McDonald himself later claimed to weep tears of relief rather than tears of joy upon hearing this news and later recollected to return to a big celebration now that this ordeal was over. An appeal on behalf of the government led to reinstatement of the indictment via an 8-0 margin within the United States Supreme Court on May the 1st, 1978. In response to this decision, Alfred Kassab informed the press that he and his wife welcomed the development, stating, it was a tremendous personal pressure to have someone running around that you are convinced killed your daughter and grandchildren. On October the 22nd, the Fourth Court, uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals rejected McDonald's double jeopardy arguments. 
Um, McDonald was brought to trial on July 16th, 1979 and charged with three counts of murder. He was tried in Riley, North Carolina before Judge Dupree and depleted not guilty to the charges. McDonald was defended by Bernard and Wade Smith, James Blackburn and Brian Murtaugh prosecuted the case. Initial jury selection began on this day and would continue for three days. Although McDonald's lawyers have been confident of an acquittal, successive strategies and rulings transpired against the defense. The first ruling against the defense was Judge Dupree's refusal to admit into evidence a 1979 psychiatric evaluation of McDonald would suggest that an individual of his personality and mindset was highly unlikely to be capable of killing his family. Dupree justified his refusal by stating that as McDonald's attorney had not entered um, an insanity plea for their client, he did not wish for the trial to be hindered by opinionated and contradictory psychiatric testimony from prosecution and defense witnesses. A further defense setback was the judge ruling against the motion to suppress McDonald's pajama top from being introduced as evidence. On the first day of the trial, Judge Dupree allowed the prosecution to admit into evidence the 1970 copy of Esquire magazine found in the McDonald house, part of which contained a lengthy article relating to the Manson family murders. However, Dupree also refused the prosecution request to allow any sections of the Article 32 transcripts from McDonald's 1970 Army hearing to produ be produced as evidence, ruling that as the current trial was a civilian trial and the Article 32 military hearing held several reports from the military investigators, which has suggested that McDonald may have murdered his family in a drug-induced rage. The evidence was also opinionated. Um, in his opening statement to the jury delivered on July 19th, James Blackburn outlined the proof of burden the prosecution faced in proving McDonald's guilt, that the prosecution intended to meet his, this burden, and that the murders had been committed with malice and forethought. Blackburn then outlined the prosecution's intention to outline both physical and circumstantial evidence indicating McDonald's guilt and to introduce numerous witnesses imploring the jurors to listen to the evidence that comes from the witness stand, examine the evidence as it is shown to you, and reach your own conclusion. Blackburn finished his opening statement by stating to jurors, basically, we believe that the physical evidence points to the fact that, unfortunately, one person, not two, not three, not four, or more, killed Colette, Kimberly, and Christian, and that that person is the defendant. Wade Smith then argued on behalf of the defense. Smith referenced the events of 17 February 1970, the Army investigation and subsequent dismissal of, all, dismissal of all charges, repeatedly emphasizing that the case had occurred over nine years ago and that in the intervening years, Jeff had done his utmost to rebuild his life while others would not let him forget his painful past. Their client, had now been brought to trial to face charges of murdering his wife and children. Smith emphasized to the jurors their ability to relieve this, their client of his ongoing ordeal by acquitting him of all charges. Um, on One of the chief prosecution witnesses to testify was Paul Stumbach. I probably said that wrong whom the prosecution summoned to testify on August the 7th. Stumbach um, de demonstrated to the jurors how McDonald's pajama top had been pierced by 48 small, smooth, and cylindrical ice pick holes after the garment had been placed atop his wife's chest. He contended that in order for the holes to have been as smooth and devoid of fraying and tearing, the garment would have had to remain stationary. An extremely unlikely occurrence if, as McDonald's contended, he had wrapped it around his hands to defend himself from blows from the attacker, wielding an ice picker club. Furthermore, he demonstrated that by folding the garment in the manner depicted in the crime scene photographs, 
all 48 holes could have been made by th 21 thrusts of the ice pick through the garment and in, a, in an identical pattern, implying that Colette had been repeatedly stabbed through a pajama top while the garment was lying on her body. A further piece of damaging evidence against McDonald was the audio tape made of the April 6, 1970 interview by military investigators, which was played in the courtroom immediately after the jurors had returned from visiting the still intact crime scene. The jury heard McDonald's matter of a fact and different res, um, rendition of the murders. They heard him become angry, defensive, and emotional in response to suggestions by the investigators. He then, that he, oh, I'm sorry, that he had committed the murders. He asked the investigators why would they think he, who had a beautiful family and everything going for him, could have murdered his family in cold blood for no reason. The juror also heard investigators later confront him with their knowledge of his extramarital affairs, to which McDonald murmured, oh, you guys are more thorough than I thought. <laughs> okay. Despite earlier rulings against the defense counsel, the prosecution also hammered by the lack of an obvious motive for McDonald to have committed the murders. He had no history of violence or domestic abuse against his wife or children. The defense also argued that the crime scene was hopelessly compromised during the investigation and potential evidence was either destroyed, lost, or failed to have been collected. McDonald's defense attorney also called several favorable character witnesses plus a forensic expert named John or James Thornton to stand to the stand. Thornton attempted to rebut um, what the earlier man had said that the pajama top was stationary on Colette's chest rather than around his wrist as he warded off blows, stating that he had attempted to stab the pajama top wrapped around a ham with an ice pick <laughs> as an assistant moved the item back and forth, resulting perfectly cylindrical holes with no tearing around the edges of the garment. Following Thornton's testimony, prosecutors stage an impromptu reenactment of alleged attack on McDonald. They wrapped a pajama top on the same material around his hands and attempted to fend off a series of blows that Blackburn attempted to inflict on him with the ice pick used in the murders. The resulting ice pick holes in the pajama top were jagged and elongated, not smoothly cylindrical like the ones within the garment recovered upon Colette's body. Furthermore, they received a small wound on his right arm. McDonald had received no defensive wounds on his arms or hands consistent with the struggle. In addition, aside from the small smear of blood discovered upon the Esquire magazine and a single speck of blood upon McDonald's spectacles, no other blood or traces of it were recovered from the room in which McDonald claimed to have fought for his life. On the final, one of the final defense witnesses subpoenaed to testify was Helena Stockley, intended on ext extracting a confession from her that she had been <clears throat> one of the intruders McDonald claimed to have entered his house, murdered his family, and attacked him. Um, so she had, he had talked to um, Stockley in private for over two hours, attempting to persuade her to confess to end um, McDonald's years of suffering and unjust, unjustly, also promising her immunity from prosecution due to the expiration of the statute of limitations. Stockley repeatedly informed, um, informed him that she was unable to help him. She also denied ever having seen McDonald and refused to testify an act she was adamant she did not commit. Under her oath, Stockley denied any culpability in murders or any knowledge of who could have committed the acts, insistent she was un unable to recall her whereabouts on the day of the murder. She emphasized her extensive drug use in the 1970s and the intervening years out of the night of February the 16th to the 17th, 1970, and was by no means the first or last night 
in which she was unable to recall her whereabouts. Well, um, following her testimony, um, it was argued before Judge Dupree for the dismissal or introduction of testimony from several witnesses to whom Stockley had earlier allegedly confessed. On August the 20th, Dupree refused the introduction of this testimony, citing legal trustworthiness resequits and stating the introduction of these witnesses add no further value to the proceedings than what they had experienced from Stockley's own testimony. The final witness to testify on behalf of the defense was McDonald himself um, on the 23rd and 24th of August. McDonald was first questioned by Bernard. He sought to humanize his client in the eyes of the jury. He began his questioning by asking McDonald about his family. McDonald described each family member and their individual personalities, saying the family shared almost everything. We were all friends. Colette and I shared the children growing up. We shared our life experiences. He also claimed the reason he had never remarried was the fact that he was unable able to forget his wife and children, whom he thought about daily. Um, they then asked McDonald to recount his family's background, his career at Fort Bragg, and his family's general lifestyle in February 1970. He then produced several family photographs and artifacts, asking McDonald to describe each item or the circumstances surrounding each photograph and to identify the individual in each image. McDonald then recounted his life in the years since the death of his family, describing his decision to relocate to California as an effort to distance himself from well-wishers and insisting he re um, insisting the reason he worked up 80 hours a week was easier than sitting and thinking about his family. Um, the following day, James Blackburn rose to cross-examine McDonald. He began his questioning by outlining every piece of physical and circumstantial evidence recovered from the crime scene, which contradicted his own accounts of the assailants attacking him and murdering his family, instead indicated his own guilt. Blackburn typically began each question with a statement to the effect of, Dr. McDonald, should this jury find from this evidence? McDonald was unable to offer any plausible explanations for these discrepancies. For example, he was unable to explain the testimony regarding the section of lumber used in the murders, having sourced from one end of a piece of wood used to make a mattress lay on Kimberly's bed, but claimed there, were, there may have been some wood in the utility room, later adding his insistence the club had been struck um, had struck him across the head and was sort of smooth and may have been a baseball bat as opposed to a wooden instrument. He also claimed the testimony um, of Army investigators pertaining to his questioning on, <laughs> his questioning on April the 6th, 1970 was unreliable due to poor conduct of the investigators. And the fact that several weeks had elapsed between the murders and his formal questioning Questioning regarding uh, various discrepancies in his account of his movements, the injuries he sustained, and the positioning of his pajama jacket upon his body throughout the night of the murders with regards to tearing and fiber evidence sourcing from the garment. Blackburn succeeded in highlighting several discrepancies in McDonald's accounts by comparison to previous interview transcripts and his current claims and the contradictions of this testimony with the forensic evidence in response. Siegel repeatedly um, raised objections to this line of questioning, claiming the discrepancies were misleading. His uh, objections were free, for the, frequently overruled. Following a brief recess, Blackburn resumed his cross-examination. On this occasion, he illustrated instances of McDonald's adjusting his testimony regarding having moved his wife's body and after learning fibers of his pajama top were found beneath her body. He then asked direct questions regarding the location of blood, fiber, and other physical evidence within his apartment, which directly contradicted his accounts of his movements and those of the members of his family. Blackburn frequently accompanied 
these questions with the hypothetical suggestion that if the jury should find from the evidence, forensics or circumstantial evidence, which contradicted McDonald's testimony, would he have any plausible explanation for these discrepancies? McDonald did not did frequently attempt to rebuff this line of questioning, but he was typically unable to offer any explanation for this evidence. Um, so shortly after 4 p.m. on August the 29th, the jury had deliberated for six and a half hours and announced that they reached their verdict. McDonald was convicted on one count of first degree murder in the death of Christian and two counts of second degree to murder in the deaths of Collie, Coll Collie, Collette and Kimberly. Four jurors wept as they announced their verdict and McDonald's mother rushed out of the courtroom. McDonald himself displayed no emotion. Judge Dupree imposed a life sentence for each of the murders to be served consecutively. Bell was revoked and McDonald was temporarily transferred to Butner County Jail. Prior to his permanent transferal to Federal Correctional Institution in Terminal Island, California, immediately following the verdict, Alfred Kassab telephoned the family lawyer, Richard Kahn. Kassab's, Kassab thanked the lawyer for his exhaustive efforts over the years, stating, Hi, Dick. I just got what I wanted. Three life sentences. Thanks for everything. We couldn't have done it without your help. The Kassavs were informed, also informed the press that this was something that had to be done. Now we can rest in peace. McDonald appealed to Pree's bail uh, revocation ruling, requesting that bail be granted pending the outcome of his appeal. This application was rejected on September the 2nd. A further appeal to be freed on bail was rejected by the Fourth Circuit Court um, of appeals on November the 20th. On July the 29th, 1980, a panel of four Circuit Court of Appeals reversed McDonald's conviction, ruling via a 2-1 margin that nine-year delay in bringing him to trial violated his Sixth Amendment rights to a speedy trial. He was released on August the 22nd, having posted a $100,000 bail and subsequently returned to work as the Director of Emergency Medicine at St. Mary's Medical Center in Long Beach, California, and would announce his engagement to his fiance, Randy D. Marquith, in March 1982. Six months later, on December the 18th, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals voted 5-5 to hear the appeal in, in Bonk. Although, as the majority did not vote to hear his, this appeal, the application was accordingly denied, upholding the previous ruling. This decision was appealed on May 26, 1981. The Supreme Court accepted the case for consideration, hearing oral arguments on December the 7th. On March the 31st, 1982, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 that McDonald's right to a speedy trial had not been violated, stating that the time inter interval between the dismissal of the military charges and the indictment of civilian charges should not be considered in determining whether the delay in bringing McDonald to trial violated the rights for speedy trial in the Sixth Amendment. He was rearrested and returned to the federal prison, and his original sentence of three consecutive life terms was reinstated. The following year, McDonald dismissed um, Sigal, Siegel, Siegel, ah, I, I bet I'm butchering these names, as his legal representative. Defensive attorneys filed a new motion for McDonald to be freed on bail pending appeal, uh, but it was refused. His remaining points of appeal, including his contention that evidence presented at trial did not justly 
justify the finding of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt were heard on June the 9th, 1982. Although his conviction was unanimously affirmed on August the 16th, shortly thereafter, McDonald's licenses to practice medicine both in North Carolina and California were revoked. McDonald again appealed this decision, contending his conviction should be overturned due to suppressed exculpatory evidence. Dupree rejected the, these defense motions on March the 1st, 1985. The Supreme Court upheld the lower court's decision on October the 6th, 1986. A further defense motion that McDonald should be granted a new murder trial on the grounds of prosec uh, prosecutor. What is what does Kim say? <laughs> Prosecutorial misconduct was denied on July the 8th, 1991. The ruling was appealed on the grounds of judicial bias on October 3rd, but was denied. Um, a further appeal was argued before the Fourth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals in 1992. Um, this appeal listed newly discovered evidence, which McDonald contended was suppressed at his trial and which he claimed corroborated his uh, exculpatory account of the murders. The, this appeal contended that had Judge Dupree permitted this evidence, the jurors would have learned that all of the doctors hired by the defense who had worked for the Army or the government at Walter Reed Hospital had concluded that McDonald was psychologi psychologically incapable of committing such acts of violence. Like, what the hell? The court ruled against awarding a new trial on June the 2nd, saying that Judge Dupree had acted correctly when he refused to allow the jury to view a transcript of the 1970 Article 32 hearing, and because it was not an insanity trial, he had also acted properly in not allowing the jurors to hear any of the psychiatric testimony. This ruling also stated that Helena Stockley's confession of guilt pertaining to the murders was unreliable and conflicted the established facts of the case. And as such, the judge's ruling against her being allowed to testify at McDonald's 1979 trial was valid. On September the 2nd, 1997, the district court granted McDonald's motion to file a supplemental affidavit with the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. The affidavit contended, contended that although several saran wrap found at the crime scene did not match any evidentiary item recovered had most likely sourced from a doll and not a wig. These fibers were also used in, to, into manufacture of human wigs prior to 1970 and thus added to the weight of previously amiss exculpatory evidence. His motion for DNA testing upon these fibers was transferred from the fourth Circuit Court of Appeals to the District Court. McDonald's lawyers were also given the right to pursue DNA tests on limited hair and blood evidence on October the 17th, 1997. This testing began in December 2000, and McDonald's lawyers were hoping the results would tie Stockley and her then-boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, to the crime scene. On March the 10th, 2006, the Armed Forces DNA I, I did, sorry, Identification Laboratory announced that the results of the DNA testing revealed that the DNA of neither Stockley or Mitchell matched that upon any of the exhibits tested. Furthermore, although a single hair found in Colette's left palm was also um, cited by McDonald as belonging to one of the alleged intruders, this testing also revealed that, that that hair sourced from his own body. This hair was also a precise match with others recovered from the bedspread within the master bedroom upon the top sheet of Christian's bed. A hair found in Colette's right palm um, was also sourced as her own. Three hairs, one from the bed sheet, one from Colette's body, in the area of her legs and a single hair measuring one fifth of an inch beneath Christian's fingernail 
did not match the DNA profile of any McDonald family member or known suspect. In September 2012, the district court conducted a formal evidentiary hearing regarding DNA evidence and statements relating to key witnesses who offered testimony indicating McDonald's innocent. On July the 24th, 2014, the district court rejected these claims in their entirety and reaffirmed McDonald's conviction on all counts. Reportedly, McDonald was disappointed but not surprised with this ruling. He presented a motion to alter or amend his judgment to the district court, although he was denied in November 2014. He then appealed the denial of his motion to the fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. However, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit affirmed the district court's ruling on December the 21st, 2018. Shortly after McDonald's initial release from prison in August 1980, his supporters hired a retired FBI special agent and private investigator named Ted Gunderson to assist in overturning his conviction. Gunderson had contacted Helena Stockley, who on this occasion allegedly confessed that she and five members of what she described as a drug cult had developed a deep grunge, a grudge against McDonald as he had refused to treat heroin and opium addicted patients. So this is what they had wanted to put in there, but they didn't. Um, they wanted because it, it was in the 35C appeal that they didn't have in the trial. <coughs> Gunderson contacted Helena Stockley, who on this occasion allegedly confessed that she and five of the drug cult had developed a deep grudge against him and that she and other members of this group had plotted revenge against McDonald specifically intending to murder his family, but leave him alive. According to Stockley, she had telephoned the McDonald residence late in the evening on February the 16th to determine all members of the family were present in the house. Paulette had answered and stated that a babysitter would be there in the early evening, but that after she had left, all the family would be present and alone. The group had then dropped mescaline. I don't, what is that? before driving to the McDonald residence. She and four others had entered the house and confronted McDonald, intent on having him sign, signing a dextrine prescription. Although the situation quickly deteriorated, the uh, McDonald attempting to fight his attackers before quickly lapsing into unconsciousness. Stockley alleged she then ran into the master bedroom to find death to all pigs or something like that scribbled on the headboard and two of her friends bludgeoning Colette on the bed as her child lay asleep next to her. Stockley was adamant she had worn a beige floppy hat on the evening in question. On April the 16th, 2007, McDonald's attorneys filed an affidavit on behalf of Stockley's mother, Helena Teresa Stockley, who stated that her daughter had twice confessed to her that she was present in the McDonald household on the evening of the murders and that she and her daughter was afraid of prosecutors. McDonald requested to expand his then outstanding appeal to include this affidavit, David, along with all the evidence am amassed in the trial. The developments which he claimed have been subsequently discovered um, and the statements of individuals who Stockley had made these confessions. This appeal was allegedly alleged that the trial statements of prosecutor James Blackburn should be considered unreliable as he had been convicted of fraud, forgery, and embezzlement and disbarred in 1993. So, yeah, that's pretty much um, it. It's everything. That was a lot to read, but as you can see, and there's also a movie made by it, so 
or a book written about it called Fatal Vision, if you guys would like to check that out. I just thought that it was pretty interesting, given the parallels of the cases and how, I don't know, I mean, maybe not how they were found or how it got found out, but just a lot of things are familiar. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Tell me what you guys think. Yeah. Thank you guys. Love ya.